50 years ago this month was also when George Wallace took office in Alabama in a famous inaugural speech pledging segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever in a South that had segregation embedded in the constitutions of the southern states and in the institutions widespread across the north. In a society that was so segregated that it's beyond the memory we take for granted all of these things that were, were easy. College sports in the south were segregated. There were no professional sports teams in the segregated. There was no southern, there was no sun belt. It was poor. Segregated by race down to the public libraries. Segregated by gender to the point that there were no female students at the University of Virginia. Very few at my old alma mater in North Carolina. None at Yale and Princeton yet let alone West Point, let alone in combat in the military. The word gay hadn't even been invented. No, nothing for disability, no seat belts in cars, TV ads incessantly promoting cigarettes as healthy, sophisticated, and invigorating. That's 50 years ago, Wallace pledged to protect segregation, only 50 years ago. He failed, but in his failure, he invented most of the language that is chillingly contemporary today in resenting the government and the political activity that forced about these changes for equal citizenship through the doorway of race and then opening up to everybody else. He started cussing when it was no longer respectable to stand up and defend segregation. He started cussing the government and the politics that, that, that people resented and feared for these changes ahead. He talked about pointy-headed bureaucrats in Washington telling you how to run your business and where you had to send your school, children to school, and that they were in cahoots with a biased national media that had a racial agenda, uh, whose effective goal was to concentrate all central power, all power in the central government in Washington. That language is contemporary. It's the language of government is bad. It flies in the face of what I hope a historical re-reckoning. A lot of us, it started out consciously in resistance, although, Wallace's first, second step after, in, after inventing all of these ingenious terms that we live with, his second one was to insist indignantly, whenever questioned, that he had never said anything in his whole public career that had any bad racial reflection on anyone, and that there was no racial motive in any of this, because that is a sine qua non of, of creating unconscious memory and culture. And it became comfortable for a lot of people because most people are in the business of making themselves comfortable. Barack Obama is not. Any, any minority person lives having to stretch themselves across the boundaries because their accepted world is not the accepted world. So Barack Obama is the first elected African American president, but he's also the one who's mentioned race least since Dwight Eisenhower. And whenever he does, a storm comes up. If he says his, his son would have looked like Trayvon Martin, the whole world goes nuts, saying that he's being too black or he's doing. So it shows that we are accepting and we're moving forward, and it is vital, but we're doing it on our terms. Uh, that is, the majority culture is doing it on our terms, and we're, we're blind to the fact that our unconscious assumptions have our political discourse, anti-government, in which big government is, 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 is bad, is out of phase with what ought to be a very bracing and optimistic view of what we've accomplished in the last 50 years that ought to steal us for the task of again stepping outside our comfort zones and again trying to tackle difficult problems today.